All right, so we're just reading the whole chapter of Mark, but I wanted to just focus on a particular section of Mark 12, which was the first commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that is the title of my sermon this morning, a reminder that we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. So we're going to look at each of these four things that we are commanded to love God with, with and what does that mean in the Christian life. So I get the title of my sermon from verse 28 and 29 in Mark 12, where it says here, one of the scribes came <coughs> and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And you see here, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. You know, often we think about how sinful we are, or we think about, oh, you know, how sinful other people may be, and generally, when we think of a very, very sinful person, don't we think of maybe a murderer or a rapist or somebody that's done very heinous crimes against humanity? But often when you think about it, I mean, wouldn't the greatest sin be to break the greatest commandment? And yet all of us every day do not do this to the extent that we are commanded to do. That ought to put your own life in perspective, your own sinfulness in perspective when you want to compare yourselves to other people. Because the Bible says the first commandment, the greatest commandment, is to love God with everything that you are, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And yet every day we fail this commandment, don't we? But this is the first and greatest commandment. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think it's very profound teaching that Jesus gives us on this first and greatest commandment is that every law and every commandment in the Bible can be summarized into these two points. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 22, 22 verse 34. It says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? <coughs> Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So he, he, he mentions this different ways to different people because we don't know whether this is exactly the same event, same person, but he is reiterating this teaching, teaching of the first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And look at this. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So isn't that interesting? And I think it's very profound that we have people say like, hey, there's all these different commandments in the Bible and all of these different laws and... And really in perspective, if you keep it in perspective, there really isn't that many different laws in the Bible. There are not that many different commandments in the Bible. If you were to compare it to, say, even our local council laws, or even our state government laws, or our federal government laws. I mean, those laws span books and books and books and books. And people think that, you know, the government system or the laws in the Bible are oppressive. Yet they're fine with law after law after law in local government and state government and federal government. E even to the point where people think, oh, our politicians aren't doing anything because they're not passing more laws. And then there's plenty of laws out there. We need laws repealed. But if you compare that to the laws of God, the laws of God are actually quite liberating. Man, if we were to go to a system, you know, people think, oh, you know, the Old Testament, so oppressive. It's so, you know, there's just all these commandments that you have to keep. And yet the Old Testament commandments can fit in a, like in a single volume as opposed to the laws we have in Australia at the local, the state and the federal level. So it's pretty profound that all these laws, and in perspective, it's not that many compared to most governments, can be summarized into two commandments. 
to love God and to love others as yourself with all that you have. And we learn here that because loving God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength, loving your neighbour as yourself is summarised by the commandments of God, you can't detach loving God and loving your neighbour with keeping the commandments of God. Am I right? You can't say you love God when you're breaking his commandments. You can't say you love others as you love yourself when you're breaking his commandments. So we don't just love people the way we think love should be handled. We love people the way God commands us to love. So when we are obeying God's commandments, this is how we love. That's why the Bible says this is love, as we walk after his commandments. Keeping God's commandments and loving God and loving people are one and the same thing because the commandment is to love. So we're going to look at the four different factors of what we are commanded to love with, right? Because as we go to Mark, we see here that's the most extensive uh, commandment where he mentions four things to love him with. The heart, the soul, the mind, and the strength. Because we know we ought to love God well, what does it mean to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? So we're going to talk about that today. Obviously, you may have some ideas of your own. I want to share some of my thoughts on these different areas. So the first one we want to look at is loving God with all your heart. And probably this is the one we, we probably think of first and foremost when we think of love, right? We think of love as an emotion. We think of love as this desire. We think of love as, you know, what's, what's, your, what's your purpose for living, what you want to serve, but that's what's more important. Right? When you love, love is how you serve. Love is not just an emotion. The emotion should follow the service. Because you can be very emotional about something, have, have lust or desire about something, but that doesn't mean you're always doing what's best for somebody. You're always doing what's loving towards them. Oftentimes, you know, people are very emotional, or they, or they really they have the, the, the emotional love for somebody to the point they want to spend so much time with them that they skip church to spend time with them. Right? Or they skip, you know, they, 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 don't, they, they skip soul winning because they want to spend time together and things like that. This is not the sort of love that God commands. The sort of love that we ought to have is we also think about our example to the people we love. Right? What, are we, what are we portraying in our testimony as what's important in life? So part of the way I love my family is I serve God and I show them, hey, soul winning, church, you know, things of God are important. That's one way I love. It's not just this desire. But when we think about loving God, probably loving him with all our heart is the first thing we think of. And I think it's no, it's no coincidence that when, when the first commandment is taught, that heart is mentioned first. Because how often have you heard that, you know, the heart of the matter is often a matter of the heart, isn't it? And often how we serve God and how we love God in other areas really comes down and is uh, foundational to first, we have to love God in the heart. And, and that's where it all starts because what, where our heart is, is what we value, isn't it? And if we value the wrong things, we're not even going to have a love for God if we value the wrong things. Um, we looked at this verse, um, I can't remember last week or the week before, Matthew 6. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Man, and even though we are so familiar with this passage, isn't it just a great reminder every time you read this passage? Because especially in the society and the prosperity that we live in, it's so easy to just get carried away with laying up treasures on earth. You know, thinking about your retirement, thinking about having a comfortable life, thinking about just, hey, I want to make enough money so I can relax and, you know, give a good lifestyle for my children. Is this what life is about? I mean, even if you have to work and struggle your whole life, but yet you build some character into your children, you show your children what it means to work. I mean, is laying up for yourselves treasures on earth really what life is about? But don't you find yourself just doing that all the time? You know, when, you get, when you're just working, you know, you're just thinking about things at home, and you just get caught up in just thinking about the temporary, thinking about the physical. So it's a great, always a great reminder when we read passages like this from Jesus. 
Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, when moth and rust doth corrupt, and when thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, when neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Look at this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, so to love God with all your heart is to value God. That's what you treasure, right? You treasure the things of God. You treasure the eternal things. So when you think about loving God with all your heart, the questions you ought to be asking yourself is, you know, what are you living for? When you think about why, why do I get up in the morning? Why do I work hard? Why do I, you know, why do I do what I do? If you say it's, oh, you know, it's just to be comfortable. Well, you're not loving God with all your heart. If you say, I do it for my kids. My kids are the reason why I live. My family is the reason why I live. You're not loving God with all your heart. Why? Because God has to be loved with all your heart. The reason, the first and foremost reason you ought to be living is God. And then things go on from that. You know, why do you do things for your kids? Because you love God with all your heart. You know, why do you work? Why do you do all these other things? Because you love God with all your heart. So you've got to think about what are you living for? What is your purpose? Why are you here? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you do what you do? If you're loving God with all your heart, then you'll answer in your own heart, well, God is the reason why I do these things. You know, what do you desire? You know, what gets you excited? This is how you know whether you're loving God with all your heart, is what gets you excited about things. Is serving God what gets you excited? Or other things? Because if there are other things that get you more excited than God, that's where your heart is. That's where your treasure is. Some people it's money. Some people it's sports. Some people it's just building a name for themselves. That's what gets them excited, as opposed to building up the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And often you know your heart. Like when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Oftentimes, how you utilize your resources really reveals where your heart is. Right? Because when we give, when we utilize our resources, really we can only give in two ways. Right? We can either give our time or we can give our money. And really, your time and your money are the same thing if you think about it, because it takes time to make money and your money is really a, a measure of the, of the time you've put in you know, uh, making that money. And, and money can kind of buy you time, can't you? Because if you don't have to work for money, now you've got more time in order to serve. So it's kind of, it's funny that it's, it's kind of like you have this economic potential, don't you? And then as you make money, that, that economic potential is stored up and then you can use that. And if you're more productive, then you can obviously, you know, get more time than your standard 80, 90 years if you have, you know, if you're more productive in how you make money. But how you utilize that money often shows where your heart is. Look at here in Mark 12, and we read one passage about the widow. It says here, Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So you see, when we talk about giving our time and our money, we can think about it in two ways. Right? You're either thinking about quantity or quality. So just talking about the money example, we can think about quantity, right? And it's not, when we think about quantity, it's not just absolute quantity that is given that God is looking at. If you look at, when he looks at this widow, it's not the absolute amount that is given compared to the rich people. It's actually the proportion in which you give. And oftentimes, how people spend their money shows where their heart is. You know, what they give it to, what they support, what they're willing to spend their money on and how they spend it shows often reveals where their heart is. But when we talk about quantity, what God is looking at, he doesn't look at the absolute quantity in comparison to other people. He looks at the proportion in which people are giving. And that's why when he looks at this widow, 
he sees, hey, even though she only cast in two mites, he says, hey, this poor widow has actually cast in more than all these rich people have cast in. Why? Because they have so much riches. And when they give a lot, they're actually giving a much smaller proportion of their wealth than this widow is. So when we think about giving to God, are we giving the most that we can? Right? Even though some of us may give more than others, if we're just giving of our abundance, we're not actually loving God with all our heart as much as the next person is who is giving a much higher proportion. And obviously you can give to God in all different ways. Right? So when I talk about giving, I'm not just saying giving more to this ministry. And obviously we need to give consistently to keep this ministry going, but how else do you spend your money? You know, when, there is, when, there's, when there's a cause out there that requires funds, do you give to it? Do you give to people out there that are fighting the good fight? You know, I've given to, you know, you know I, I, don't, I don't like, you know, have mandatory vaccinations. I've given to, you know, vaccine, you know, anti-vaccine networks and stuff to try and fight that fight for us. Or, you know, you know giving money to political parties and things like that. People fighting fights that we are not necessarily involved in. Do you spend your money to further causes like that? That shows where your heart is, if you want the sort of society that we have. So that's one way we can measure whether or not we are loving God with all our heart. But when we think about time, giving time to God, obviously we can give a quantity of time. But what I want you to think about also is the quality of time that you give God. Look at Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1. Remember now, thy creator, look at this, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And I won't read the whole chapter of Ecclesiastes 12, but make sure you read it if you haven't before. It's such a beautiful passage about saying, hey, now is the time to serve God while you have your youth while you have your health. Why? Because one day, the day will come where you don't have those things anymore. So people always say, oh, you know, like, well, one day I'm going to serve God, you know, when I've got all my ducks in a row. Um, just makes me think of, you know, Nathan told me a story recently about somebody he knows that, um, that is 50 years old and just received news that they have, have a terminal brain cancer. And, you know, when I think about somebody that is 50 years old, 55 years old and then they get hit with some sort of terminal illness I just think man surely that person Probably has thought in their life, you know, I'm gonna work hard You know, I'm gonna work hard at my job work hard at my business Set a life up for myself so that I can retire at 65 and take it easy and yet people reach 50 55 60 and Don't even reach that point in life. It just reminds me of the rich fool Right? The rich fool that builds up barns and stores all his goods and thinks, hey, one day I'm just going to be able to eat, drink, and be merry. And yet God says, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then who's are those goods that you've, that you've labored to build up? So such a sad thing. That's why like, when we think about giving time to God, you may think, oh, in the future, I'm going to be able to serve God all the time. What if you don't even make it to that point? And what sort of quality of the time are you giving to God? Why does God get the scraps of your life? Why does God get what's, what's left over after you've spent all, all the prime years of your life serving yourself? Why don't you give God some of the quality of your life where you're young, where you have strength, where your mind is still sharp? And you can give some of those days to God. That's why the Bible says, remember now thy creator. Not remember later. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So how we spend our time and our money reveals to us our heart. So the question is, how do you love God with all your heart? Well, is he the reason why you're living? Is he, the re is he who you're serving? Because often the ones that we love are the ones that we serve. Right? You think about you know, the, the classic example is you know, two people that are just newly dating, right? 
They're thinking about each other all the time. They're exciting, excited when they contact each other. Man, they want to spend every waking moment with each other. This is what we think about when we love somebody. We want to, we want to be with them. We want to serve them. We want to do things for them. That's what it means to love God with all your heart. All right, let's go on to the second one. Loving God with all your soul. Now, what does that mean? When I think of loving God with all your soul, what is your soul? I mean, your soul is the very essence of who you are, right? It's, it's you. Because if you think about you are your soul, and then you have an aspect that is the spirit, which is how you connect with the spiritual world, and then you have your flesh, which is how you interact with the physical world. But the soul is who you are. See, when you get saved, your spirit and your soul will change one day. I mean, when the moment you believe on Jesus Christ, your spirit is born again, and one day your body is going to be born again. But your soul does not change. Who you are does not change. So when you love God <coughs> with all your soul, you know what I think about loving God with all your soul? It's about who you are. Are you willing to identify with Jesus Christ? Are you willing to stand tall and say, I am a believer. Yes, I go to church. Hey, what did you do on Sunday? Hey, I went to church. Hey, I spent time with some of my church friends. Where people know. Do people know that you're a believer? Are you ashamed to be known as a believer? Why are you ashamed to be known as a believer? This is how you love God with all your soul. Realizing that you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ in this world. So you need to stand tall as a believer. You know, the Muslims don't back down. I mean, the Muslims wear their scarves proudly and their burqas proudly. And yet Christians nowadays, where did they go? They're all hiding in the closet. You don't know whether people are Christians. But you know what? In your workplace, amongst your peers, people ought to know that you're a believer. You know, they should know. Because they know the way you behave, the way you act, the, what, the things that you talk about. There ought to be a difference. 2 Corinthians 5. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is when, you know, you have a king or a government and somebody goes representing that government. Right? We have ambassadors for Australia or ambassadors for whatnot. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, you know, kings would send messengers and they would be an ambassador. What? They would be representing the king. And the Bible says here as Christians, hey, we are ambassadors for Christ. As we live in this world, do you know that you are here to represent Jesus Christ? So think about, what sort of ambassador are you? When people look at you, what sort of picture are they getting of Jesus Christ? That's what we ought to think about. Because the world doesn't see Jesus. right? The world doesn't see him walking about talking with people, going about his work. You know what they ought to be looking at to get a picture of Jesus? You. You need to be that ambassador. You need to be that image of Christ on this earth. So when people think, hey, what does it mean to be a godly, God-fearing believer? They can say, ah, I know somebody at work who's a, you know, a godly, a hard worker, somebody that represents Jesus. They ought to think that of you. So when you think about your own testimony, you know, are you somebody that can stand tall and say, hey, you know, I, I think I do a, a pretty decent job, at least outwardly, showing the world what a believer should be like? Or is there a bit of shame then? As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So we don't want to be ashamed of who we are. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. So it's like saying, hey, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of what you do for Jesus. You know, the church you're a part of and all these sorts of things. Nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So when you think about yourself being an ambassador, is there a difference in your behavior? You know, we talk about not being ashamed about being different, but maybe some people need to be ashamed that there's no difference in the way you are. 
right? When, when people look at you and they look at the world, do they see the same thing? The way you behave, the way you speak, the things that you talk about. Is there any difference? You know, sometimes we talk, you know, like I said, we talk about being ashamed of standing for the truth, but unfortunately, usually it's the other way around with Christianity. It's that Christians need more shame that they're not different enough from the world. People ought to see a difference from the world. Why? Because Christians ought to behave differently, ought to act differently, ought to speak differently, ought to dress differently, ought to value different things. Right? So we're not just talking about only looking different, but also our character ought to be different as well. And people notice that. You know, I've had even people at my workplace, you know, where, you know, you, you, just the way you talk, the things that you talk about, the things you don't joke about, the things you don't find funny, and when they find out you're a Christian, they kind of, they think, you know, have, I don't know if that's ever happened in your life where people find out you're a Christian, and they're like, well, they, they expected that. They expected this person to be religious, or they expected them to be a church goer, but just because of the way they behave, the way they presented themselves. And this is, this is how I believe we love God with all our soul. It's our identity. It's who we are, that we are not ashamed to identify with Jesus and be that ambassador for him. All right, let's go on to the third one. Loving God with all our mind. And I feel like this is the one where Christians get a bit slack. And this is a dangerous one because if we do not love God with all our mind, you know what's going to happen? We're going to raise a generation of ignorant Christians. And this is what happens when we, as leaders in our family, like parents, if we do not love God with all our mind, we are going to raise children that don't know how to love God with all their mind. And this is what happens when people grow up and they start rejecting God for silly reasons like, well, if there's a loving God, why is all this suffering in the world? You know, they, they start believing things like evolution because they've been talked into that. They don't realise the difference just between changes in species and actually creating life from nothing. And sometimes they don't understand that difference. Why? Because Christians have loved God with all their heart. You know, they love God so much, you know, they go to church all the time, but they haven't loved God with all their mind. Now, what does that mean, to love God with all your mind? Well, in Mark 12, when Jesus gave the first commandment, it's interesting that when the scribe answers Jesus, he actually quotes loving God with all your mind with a different word. The scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the heart, look at this, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Isn't that interesting? You know, see, what, how you love God and how you love others is actually better than what you give to God, you know, when you think about your offerings. <clears throat> I look at what he says here. He says, to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding. So what does it mean to love God with all your mind? It means that you actually desire to understand God, right? Understand the things of God. You have a desire to learn. See, some people, they just go to church and they're just like, oh, they're just blissfully ignorant. They think that it's fine to be, they're just like, oh, you know, oh, God's complicated and you know, I, just, I just love God anyway and just, just do my... And I do my prayers and do, go to church and just love on him and that's all that's important. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of loving God with all your heart. But we're not only commanded to love God with all our heart, we're commanded to love him with all our mind as well. So we don't want to be intellectually lazy when it comes to the things of God and just think, ah, you know, that, that's for other people to figure out, other people to understand those parts of the Bible, other people, yeah, that's for Victor to understand those hard doctrines. No, no, no. It's for you to understand too. You need to love God with all your mind because you have an obligation and a commandment from God not just to love God with all your heart, soul and strength, but also with all your mind. And that is the understanding. That is the desire to learn. And this is all through Proverbs. Proverbs 4 verse 5. Look at this. Get wisdom. Get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. 
Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding. I love how that's phrased. I always, I always think of this passage when I think about loving God with all your mind. It's like, hey, with all your getting, hey, while you're out there trying to get material things and get all this other stuff, hey, get understanding at the same time. It's like, with all your getting, get understanding too. You know, when you're out there trying to hoard things and whatnot, hoard some wisdom. So when we think about loving God with all your mind, you've got to have a desire to learn. You know, you've got to be reading the Bible, reading the Word, reading passages that you're unfamiliar with. You know, if there are parts of the Bible you're unfamiliar with, when you love God with all your mind, there's a desire there to say, hey, you know what, I want to learn that part about God. I mean, if you think of the Bible, if the Bible is God, because the Word is God, and you don't know all the Bible, that means there's a part of God that you, you don't know. I mean, if you love somebody, don't you want to know everything about them? Yeah. And if there are parts of the Bible you don't know, then you're not loving all of God. You don't even know all of God. So you need to get to know those portions so you can get to know God better. Because you know what? The more you get to know His Word, the more you know God. So learning passages you're unfamiliar learning doctrines that you're not familiar with. If there's a doctrine that you struggle to understand, hey, trying to meditate and think about those things and studying up on that thing, that's how you love God with all your mind. When you meditate on the Word and you think about it, you try and figure it out to get, you know, love God with all the understanding. You know, learning answers to objections. You know, so it may not just be doctrines, it can also be how to defend that doctrine and having a desire to learn that rather than just going, ah, oh, you know, I'm not the intellectual type. No, you've got to be the intellectual type. Right? So there are areas that you may not be gifted in, but you need to grow in those areas. Right? Just like here. You know, you need to grow in your love of God with all your mind. First Peter 3. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Look at this. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, how can you be ready always to give an answer to people that are asking you questions if you don't have a desire to learn how to answer those questions? So that's why it always comes back to the heart. Right? The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. You've got to want to learn more when you want to learn more then that's how you worship god with your mind and some just practical things you can do to increase your knowledge is you know how do you what do you listen to when you're traveling you know oftentimes when we're traveling on the train traveling on the bus or we're driving or we've got some spare time and we're just taking it easy i mean what, what do you listen to do you just turn on the radio and just Listen to Kyle and Jackie O. <laughs> rather, rather, you know, listen to I don't know, like some somebody else, you know. Or even you know, you might turn on Two GB and just listen to you know whatever Alan Jones has got to serve up. You know, sometimes that's interesting. Or why don't you be a bit more purposeful about what you learn? You know, rather than just letting the radio just serve up whatever they want to teach you, why don't you you know subscribe to some specific podcasts? Download some specific MP3s. Download some specific sermons. You know, download an audio Bible. Hey, maybe it's a part of the Bible you haven't read before. Why don't you get the audio version of it and listen to that? So these are just some practical things. Rather than just putting the vain music on, you know, just, you know maybe at home, right? You just get home, just turn the TV on. It's just playing. Just, you know, and it's just slowly just seeping into you. You know, just all the filth. You know, because yeah, maybe, maybe you turn it on to watch one thing, but then you soak up everything else as well, right? So rather than just getting home and just letting the TV play in the background, why don't you play something spiritual? You know, either maybe some songs. If you want some music, get some songs that teach you good doctrine, that remind you about the love of God, remind you about the things you should be doing for God. Or put on a sermon. Put on a podcast where you're learning about things from people that, you know, maybe apologetics podcasts and things like that, and you can learn more about these things. This is one way you can love God with all your mind. What are you filling your mind with, right? Does your, is your mind reserved for the things 
of God. And number four, so we talked about loving God with all your heart, loving God with all your soul, loving God with all your mind, loving God with all your <coughs> strength. So when we talk about, when we think about loving God with all your strength, I mean, that just comes down to actually physically doing things for God. You know, whether it's the soul winning. You know, like you, when you love God with all your strength, I mean, you're going to go soul winning, whether it's hot, whether it's cold. I mean, it's like some people, yeah, there are times when you're sick and you can't do things. But I'm sure there are times when people are sick and yet there are still things that they would do anyway, right? Whether maybe it's play a soccer game, right? You, even though you're sick, hey, you'll still go to the soccer game. Hey, if you're sick, you'll still make it to that concert that you paid for. Hey, if you're sick, you can still go to the movies. You can do all those things that you want to do. But when you're sick, do you still, you know, go soul winning? Even though you're not feeling 100%, you just go anyway? Why? Because you're loving God with all your strength? What about just, you know, when you're working here? You know, when you're doing things for God? Like, do you do things with diligence? Do you do it quickly? Loving God with all your strength? Are you on time, even? Loving God with the body, you know, in the actual physical things that you do. When you think about, hey, what do I do for God physically? Am I doing it to the best of my ability? And not everything we do for God in this technological world is even just physical strength. Sometimes the things we do are, you know, mental, right? Maybe it's organizing things, contacting people and whatnot. But when we love God with all our strength, the question is, are we doing it to the best of our ability or are we slacking off for God when we do something for God? Not only that, are we doing it diligently? Are we doing it consistently? This is how we love God with all our strength. 2 Timothy 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. When I think of what is our church's verse this is the verse i think of this is why our logo is a bible in a speech bubble preach the word be instant in season out of season see we do it consistently whether it's popular or not popular whether we feel like doing it whether we don't feel like doing it we do it anyway this is how we love god with all our strength it's the same with your children sometimes you don't feel like doing it but you do it anyway this is how you love with your strength with your body. You ought to love God in the same way. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, there is a lot said in the book of Proverbs about diligence. And when I think of diligence, I think of doing things not only to the best of your ability, but having an attention to detail. You know, oftentimes people you know, don't have an attention to detail. They do things and they're skipping over things or they're cutting corners. We ought not be like that when we're serving God. When we're serving God with all our strength, we're not only trying to do the best, we're trying to be diligent as well and having a, an attention to detail. Let's read some verses about diligence in Proverbs. Proverbs 13 verse 4, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Proverbs 21 verse 5, The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. So what I find is, is kind of the, the, I don't know if it's a paradoxical thing about diligence, is people often think, hey, if I'm, people often are lazy to be diligent. But what the Bible teaches is, is your life is actually easier when you're diligent, right? So when you're diligent, you have things, right? And life is harder when you're not diligent. It's the same here. Diligent people are productive people. But of everyone that is hasty, the one that cuts corners, they actually end up desiring things, not having things, right? So it's funny that when you're diligent, when you're willing to just do that little bit of extra work diligently, life is actually easier. But you would think, well, if I'm diligent, life, that's actually harder to do. Right? But it's actually the opposite way around. I just think that's a, a bit of wisdom from the Bible that if you are diligent, you're actually making your life easier than cutting corners. Proverbs 22 verse 29. 
Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. So we want to keep busy, right? So not only when you do something for God, when you love God with all your strength, not only when you do something for God, you do it diligently, you do it to the best of your ability, but are you keeping busy for God as well? In terms of like, do you have too much idle time? Right, because are you loving God with all your strength when 90% of your life is just relaxing and taking it easy? When there's so much strength there that could be used to do something for God. 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you see here, we ought to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. So we're not just being diligent and loving God with our strength when we do that one thing every now and then. We've got to get busy for God. So I kind of think, you know, everyone has a hobby. Everyone wants to do things on the side. Maybe consider, rather than a hobby, starting a ministry. You know, what, what, is there, what is something that you can do for God so in that spare time, rather than just doing something that is vain, that just brings you pleasure, actually helps the kingdom of God. Could you be soul winning more? You know, if you're already soul winning once a month right now, could you be going once a week? If you have more time during the week, could you be going more? This is how you serve God with all your strength. And you know what? Especially for, you know, young men, staying busy is how you stay out of trouble. Right? See, when you're busy, you don't have too much idle time. Yeah, you hear like the, you know, the, uh, the idle, idle mind is the devil's play, play thing or the play shop. And that's so true. You know, keeping busy actually keeps you out of trouble. Not only for women. I mean, the Bible talks about it too, right? When it says, hey, she shall be saved in child rearing because keeping, you know, having children, marrying, bearing children, guiding the house keeps you busy doing something of value that you don't have all this idle time to go gossip and go spend time here and there wasting your husband's money. Right? So there's things like that. But also for men as well. I had this thought that staying busy, guys, especially for young men, keeps you out of pornography. Yeah. Right? Because sometimes when you're idle, you have too much time on your hands, too much time with your devices and your computer, yeah. that's when you start dabbling into pornography. Right? And this is what we see with King David, 2 Samuel 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. See, David, this was a time when he ought to be fighting. He ought to be busy doing things for God. But David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful. To look upon so just a quick point here is you know pornography is a very detrimental thing and it's something that's very captivating for young men everybody probably every young man has struggled in this area so how do you overcome pornography well one way is you get busy right? you get busy doing things you know when people are busy doing work doing meaningful things they don't have this idle time to go surfing on the internet for hours and doing these things. And that's how it happens, right? You're surfing on your idle time, surfing on the internet, and then you see one thing and then it tempts you to do another thing. So get busy. Stay busy for God. Love God with all your strength. If you stay busy, then these temptations are less. So this is one area that affects men, but you have the, the same that affects women as well, right? Where women, they don't get busy, they start being busybodies and tattlers because they have all this time to chat around and to gossip and all this sort of stuff as opposed to getting busy for God, doing things either for their children or doing things for the body of Christ. So I hope that sermon was a blessing for you. Just a reminder that we ought to love God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. So how do you do it with the heart? It's giving your all, isn't it? Why you live, what you desire, your purpose in life. To love God with all your soul is who you are. So you ought to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Think about when people look at you, are they seeing the image of Jesus Christ? 
If they're not, there should be some shame there, right? That we are not different enough from the world where people see a difference in a Christian. Loving God with all the mind is getting understanding, right? Not being intellectually lazy, but getting an understanding of God and knowledge of God and continuing to strive to understand and to defend the faith and to love God with all your strength is right. You serve with diligence and you stay busy. Now, just one last point I want to finish on is <clears throat> what's going to make somebody love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? And I've uh, talked about this before, but I want to leave you with this thought. In 1 John 4, the Bible says, We love him because he first loved us. So maybe you're listening to this sermon and you're thinking, man, I just, I just don't even have a desire to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because today's sermon was about how you do that. So how do you build a love for God? Well, it's to realize what God has done for you. you know, and I think if you take some time and reflect how God has blessed you, what God does for you, what God did for you at the cross, it's reflecting and being reminded of those things that drives you to do your reasonable service, which is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I don't think it's an accident that the Bible says this in 1 John 4. Why do we love God? Well, because he first loved us. And oftentimes people don't love God because they haven't really reflected or really thought about how God loves them. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for life. Thank you for the things that you've done for us and for the things you continue to do for us that we just take for granted every day. So, Lord, we just pray that as we reflect on how you love us and how you provide for us and the many blessings you've given us in this life, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And I pray, Lord, that this sermon today has given people a more practical look at the first and greatest commandment. Um, so help us, Lord. We need your grace because we are sinful people. We come short. We don't do what we ought to, we don't do what we ought to do. So Lord, just help us to get us back walking on the right path. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>